can become so specialized in medicine, you know, reading only your specialty. Uh, I can remember years ago, I think we were on Good Morning America with the chief of oncology at Sloan Kettering, and I said a very simple fact, that married men with the same cancers live longer than single men. And he said, where did you read that? I said it was even in the New York Times. And he said, that's not a medical journal. <laughs> he, he doesn't want to accept that simple fact, so he's yelling it's not a medical journal. And that's the sad part. Uh, I would say about your life, just keep open minds. Um, I'm laughing because, yeah, I, I, I carry everybody's letters and notes and poems when I come here, so I have a lot of papers. But I never decide what I'm going to say until I get here. And, you know, the first thought I have is read the book Cancer Ward. It's written by a man who's had cancer, Solzhenitsyn. And as I'm reading it, suddenly, boom, on that page, he says, one of the men is sitting in the ward reading this book. And he turns to the others, he says, hey, it says here, there are cases of self-induced healing. Not recovery through treatment, but actual healing, see? Now, first, he didn't say spontaneous remission, okay? Because how do you have a spontaneous remission? He said there are cases of self-induced healing. And then he goes on to say, it was as though self-induced healing fluttered out of the great open book like a rainbow-colored butterfly for everyone to see, and they all held up their cheeks for its healing touches as it flew past. It was only the gloomy Padiev who made his bed creak and with a hopeless and obstinate expression on his face said, I suppose for that you need to have a clear conscience. Everything you need to know is right on that page. Okay? What is a butterfly symbol of transformation? The caterpillar dissolves and the butterfly is created. Why a rainbow? You'll be seeing some slides. Every color is an emotion. He's talking about your life and getting that in order. And what I have learned, and I mean this literally, what is your life about? I'm always saying, life is a labor pain, but I don't let other people impose the pain on me. Okay? Whether that's a change in my lifestyle or having an operation, I'll decide. And again, why I show you the drawings, because Two people can have an operation. For one, it's heaven. For the other, I'm being cut up and mutilated because my parents don't love me and they brought me here to have this happen. See, it's my punishment. And their response after surgery is going to be enormously different. So what life is about is being born again. I mean, that has really hit me lately. Everything you listen to is that message. They who inherits the kingdom of heaven? I was just reading something last night. Children. So become a child, see? Um, rebirthing, transformation, born again, it doesn't matter what you call it. Um, and I see this all the time. You learn you have three months to live, what do you do? Well, to quote somebody, see, all the letters I have. She said, I'd been told I was gonna die several times, but I didn't believe them. But this time, the way I felt, I agreed with the doctor. I had about two months to live. So I went home. And I made out a will and gave away my treasures. Now I always say, that's not a denial of your mortality. See? But then she said, I bought a dog, put a wildlife habitat in my backyard, laughed more, took some vitamins, and it goes on and on. And the letter finishes with, I didn't die, and now I'm so busy I'm killing myself. Help, where do I go from here? <laughs> my simple advice was take a nap. Okay? <laughs> because she's burning up, not out. And what a difference. To me, the most significant public health issue on our planet is parenting. If everybody grows up loved, we don't have a problem. A study of Harvard students. While you're at Harvard, you're asked, did your parents love you? Think what you would answer right now. Did your parents love you? I don't care if they were mass murderers. The question is, did they love you? See? They could be drug addicts, alcoholics, but did they love you? The students who said yes, 35 years later, one out of four had suffered a major illness. Those who said no, over 90% had, okay? So addictions are not an accident. They're a search for something you never got. You have a different nervous system if you grow up unloved and untouched. Uh, you know, everybody studies the animals and monkeys and other things, and you watch what happens to them when they're taken away from their parents. Um, it's a disaster, what they're like when you put them back in the cage. They literally become alcoholics if you leave alcohol, and they're violent. And see, this is why you can rebirth people. See, I'm a CD for a lot of people. 
That's called the chosen dad. There are suicidal kids who are alive today because I said I love you. And some of my patients who are killing themselves. See, what I love is you have a sign in the waiting room, no smoking, and somebody comes in, sits under it, and lights a cigarette. What the hell is she? Stupid? No. But she wants a reaction. Okay? And my reaction is I love you. I don't like what you're doing in the waiting room, but I love you. And instead of rejecting her and saying, I'm not giving you a return appointment, what the hell's the point? I would say, I'll see you next week. And keep hugging them. And you know what happens six months later? They ask for your help to stop smoking, get off drugs, and hope. Why? Because you have proved to them they're worth something. So believe me, rebirth the kids of this world. Reparent them. Uh, you go into a high school and you say, write a suicide note and a love note for homework. Think what you would write. Okay. And I can tell you, when they bring them in and put them on the desk, the suicide pile is that high and the love pile is that high. Three to five pages in suicide, not a page on why I'm loving. And then the kids start talking to each other and the suicide rate goes down in the school because they realize, I'm not the only one who feels that way. Okay. But what I want to teach people to do is eliminate what's killing you. Don't kill yourself. Okay. And they have to learn how to do that. And often, as I say, you learn you have life-threatening illness, you say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what makes me happy. And then you realize a few months later, hey, well, these are all you know, phone calls and people I know. A man I know had a few months to live. He said, I love Colorado. I want to die there in the mountains. And I said to the family, I feel very close to him. I want to be invited to the funeral. A year goes by and there's no call. I was really angry as hell. <clears throat> so I call up and he answers the phone. And I said, you know, I was really angry. I wasn't invited to your funeral. He said, oh, it's so beautiful here. I forgot to die. Um, a multimillionaire in Florida has two months to live. He bought a house on the ocean, which he ne always could afford, but never had time for. He's so busy. He took his tie off because he said, there's no point wearing a tie. So I let all my employees just, no, you know, no dress code anymore. He lived for five and a half years just enjoying his time. Well, here's words from Plato. And therefore, if the head bo and body are to be well, you must begin by curing the soul. That's the first thing. So don't forget that. And then the wisdom of Woody Allen. Two guys are talking. One says, it restates the negativeness of the universe, the hideous, lonely emptiness of existence, nothingness, the predicament of man forced to live in a barren, godless eternity like a tiny flame flickering in an immense void with nothing but waste, horror, and degradation, forming a useless, bleak straitjacket in a black, absurd cosmos. And the other guy says, what are you doing Saturday night? <laughs> Committing suicide. Well, how about Friday night? <laughs> When I read that, I thought, you got it, see? I mean, accept your mortality, but you don't live in fear of death. It's a very different concept. So yeah, you may end your life Saturday, but why not enjoy Friday? And the other is the movie Harold and Maud. If you haven't seen that, I insist you see it. I've watched it God knows how many times over the years. It's probably. 20 or 30 years, Harold and Maud, M-A-U-D-E. Ruth Gordon plays someone who at age 80 commits suicide. But she teaches a young college student about life. And he's into death because he blew up the chemistry lab and runs home knowing that he's going to get hell from the school. But they think he's dead because they don't see, you know, they don't find him. And they tell his mother they think he's dead. And she doesn't react. She's running a party in her house. Um, so he said, I decided I enjoy being dead. And his life becomes about death. His mother buys him a car to distract him. He turns it into a hearse. And then he meets Ruth Gordon at funerals. And she's into life. And I love this line from the movie. Say, give me an L, give me an I, give me a V, give me an E, live. Otherwise, you've got nothing to talk about in the locker room. After she commits suicide, and he it doesn't arrive in time to save her, you see his hearse go off a cliff, and your assumption is he's committed suicide. But then you see him walking away in the last scene, playing his banjo. Mm -hmm. And what I realize again is he eliminated death. She taught him how to do that, and he's back to life again. So accept your mortality, and that you're here for a limited time, 
but let that encourage you to do what makes you happy and feel good. Okay? Uh, I mean, I all I took this from a group because this is a group that's run by a very compulsive lady. So when you get to lecture, somebody sits in the front row and every five minutes you're told, you know, 15, 10, 5. And I took the sign because I want to remind you. And whenever I'm on a radio program, I love it. To me, the most important point is when the program's just about over and they say, we're running out of time. I say, I just hope everybody will hear that and accept that and live and enjoy the time they have. <clears throat> now I'll tell the health of the audience. What am I holding up in my hand in front of you? Yell out the answer. White paper. All right. Yeah. Say that out loud. A white paper with a dot on it. A white paper with a dot on it is the correct answer. Okay? If you shouted a black dot, you have a problem. Okay? And the closer you get to New York, the more people answered that. This is your life right here. Say, we are all wounded. And I mean that. Don't ever forget that. You know, all the health professionals here, you want to do a good job? Put a bandage over your eye when you go to work. I'm not kidding, because then people see you're wounded and they will tell you their problems, see? Because when you walk into the supermarket, everybody says, oh, well, you look okay. Um, they don't know you're wounded. I know you're all wounded. So when I go to the supermarket, we have therapy because I know everybody's got problems. And I mean it. I'm not kidding. You know, the clerk behind the counter, yeah, her brother committed suicide, see? And somebody's husband died at age 47. And she's, you know, checking you out. Uh, yeah, how do I hear all these stories? Because I don't deny my problems and my wounds. So don't hide yours. Uh, to quote a lady in Stop and Shop, where I started saying, put a bandage over your eye. I got poked in the back at the checkout counter. And she said, you're the only person in Stop and Shop who hasn't asked me what happened. She had a bandage over her eye. I said, I know what happened. She said, really? I said, yes, I have an abusive spouse also. <laughs> then I told her the real truth was I was a doctor, so a bandage didn't get me upset. Um, why I folded this, one of our kids said, Dad, if, what's going on? I said, well, everybody's got troubles. He said, fine, call your next book, holy shit. <laughs> so I just thought that was a wonderful statement. And that's, to me, the best definition of life. Uh, it, there, but what you do with the compost is what life is about, you know? And if it redirects and rebirths you, then something interesting is happening. Yeah, this I, I struck me the other day, too, because I was rereading the Bible where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and telling him about being born again. But he uses these words, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I had, was taking the dogs for a walk and really was struck by what a wonderful role model water is. Um, and we're mostly water. And when I say that, I'm not going to read your poem I ended up writing, but um, think about water. You can be ice, you can be vapor and a mist, you can be rain. Uh, you know, you can change according to whatever's needed. So always think of yourself in a sense as water and how you respond. But yes, don't freeze up and, you know, cover your heart up uh, and hurt it. But at the same time, I have to say, I was thinking that ice can cover a lake and save a lot of lives. So there's a right time for each thing in your life. But just keep being like water and whatever you need to be at that moment Go ahead and be. And another, when you have troubles. If a pregnant woman, this is written by Martin Buber, if a pregnant woman goes into labor in the eighth month when her time has not yet come, doctors try to stop her labor, but not so in the ninth month. If the woman goes into labor then, doctors try to increase it so she may give birth. That is why formerly when people called to heaven begging God to free the earth of some misery, their prayer was granted for the time was not yet come. But now that redemption is near, no prayer which ascends in behalf of the sorrowful world is of avail. But sorrow is heaped upon sorrow, so the birth may soon be accomplished. Now, you may not like that, okay? Because you may say, hey, why 
you know, aren't my prayers answered? But maybe it's not the right time. And that when you do, in a sense, know who you are and evolve, then, yeah, you may find that the curse becomes a blessing uh, because of what you learn from it. And also understand this, that I'm on the board of directors of Heaven as an outside consultant, so I get to ask a lot of questions of a lot of people. Uh, and to me, what was very painful as a physician and a healthcare worker is, why would a God make a world where